Okay, so next we are going to have a, a round uh, table um, discussion, and I believe that's going to be virtual, at least partly. Right. Um, uh, so um, the session would be real world outcomes of CAR T therapy experiences from different continents, and we're fortunate to have um, uh, experts from uh, the US, um, the UK, and also uh, France. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce um, my colleague, Dr. Loretta Nastropil. Loretta is an associate professor uh, in the department of Lymphoma at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, she's uh, section chief of uh, Indolent Lymphoma and really she's been pioneering many of the work related to CAR T cell therapy and the uh, real world uh, evidence of uh, CAR T outcomes. So Loretta, Loretta, it's wonderful to have you via Zoom. I wish you were here. Uh, we will also have Dr. Claire Roddy, who's a consultant hematologist and honorary se senior lect lecturer in hematology at UCL, and Claire did her PhD and, uh, and, and um, so scientific uh, training under the mentorship of uh, Carl Peggs. And finally, we also have Dr. Uh, Professor Christian Charbonneau, who is a professor of medicine and cell biology in Mar Marseille, and uh, very well known to many of you, multiple awards and, and a leader in the field of cell therapy and transplantation. So thank you and looking forward to the discussions. Okay, thank I really appreciate the opportunity to cover some of our experience uh, examining outcomes with commercial CAR T in the U.S. I really wish I could be there in person. Uh, it's just this new world of travel has is, is made it a little bit more challenging. These are my disclosures. So I'm going to jump right into an analysis we had conducted across 17 centers in the U.S. looking at commercial AXI cells. So we collected all patients who had undergone leukapheresis with the intent to manufacture uh, starting in September of 2018. And you can see here the sort of disposition of these patients. The vast majority were actually able to have a successful manufacturing and infusion of cells. So we really focused the analysis on these 298 patients and then the 275 who actually only went cell infusion. And identifying an unmet need, the majority of patients who never make it from leukophoresis to cell infusion actually die as a result of lymphoma uh, or progression of lymphoma that makes them poor candidates for cell infusion. So I do think there still is an unmet need uh, in terms of addressing uh, this group of patients. When we look at the characteristics of the patients who are considered an infused cell, there are a couple of things that jump out that are similar and different. So fortunately in the real world, 92% of patients who actually were, uh, again, leukophoresis had cell infusion suggesting uh, quite high rates of uh, manufacturing success. There were clear differences in the performance status. So in the ZUMA-1 pivotal phase two study that led to FDA approval of AXI cell, patients could have an ECOG performance status of zero or one. Uh, in the real world, that extends beyond just ECOG zero one. Uh, in addition, there were fewer patients that were actually uh, refractory to their most recent treatment as, again, Zuma 1 enrolled a refractory patient population and a slightly higher percentage of patients that at some point had had chemosensitive disease and underwent high-dose therapy autotransplant. We broke down the subgroups of large cell lymphoma a little bit further, not surprising in this relapsed refractory setting. You see enrichment of uh, porous features such as double or triple hit lymphoma, double expressors, uh, but it is, again, uh, at least encouraging to see uh, those types of patients included in this cohort. Not surprising, this has been uh, now reproduced across a number of these uh, real-world settings, but over 40% of patients would have failed to have qualified for the prospective phase 1-2 study of ZUMA-1, and outlined in this slide are the number of reasons, including 40% of patients that it would have failed to meet more than one exclusion criteria, performance status obviously being one of the most common, but cytopenia's recent DVT, but also we had 21 patients that had had a history of CNS disease, which I'll show you a little bit more information on at a later point. 
also different in terms of how these patients are managed in the real world. The majority actually underwent bridging therapy. So this is anti-lymphoma directed therapy between leukapheresis and cell infusion. And you can see the breakdown in the slide, the types of bridging strategies employed. Numbers are pretty small, so it's hard to draw any strong conclusions as to which might be the most effective strategy. But I think intriguing at least to acknowledge uh, that in the real world, there are a number of patients that are felt to be too unstable to do nothing other than just corticosteroids between leukapheresis and cell infusion. It's also important to highlight that these patients have worse prognosis at baseline, uh, worse IPI, more likely to have LDH elevation or bulky disease. Despite these differences in the baseline characteristics and some of the management strategies between leukapheresis and cell infusion, we do see very comparable rates of CRS uh, and ICANS, maybe even slightly more favorable rates of grade three or higher CRS, uh, very similar rates of ICANS in this real world cohort versus Zuma-1, though that is with the much higher utilization of mitigating strategies such as tocilizumab or corticosteroids, which also reflects our evolution of uh, management. We're uh, more comfortable intervening earlier uh, in the acute toxicity phase, uh, and as a result, we have higher utilization of some of these strategies. When we explore characteristics that might predict for um, grade three or higher CRS or ICANS, a couple of themes emerge. Poor performance status appears to be a strong predictor of acute toxicity. And then in regards to neurotoxicity, bulky disease, uh, comorbidities such as ejection fraction less than 50% were significant factors in our multivariate analysis. But there was also a trend uh, for neurotoxicity in patients with thrombocytopenia. Here in Jacobson's group, uh, another cohort of real-world patients treated with AxiCell, they also looked at inflammatory markers at baseline uh, and did find an association with CRP at day zero um, and the peak CRP being associated with rates of grade three or higher ICANs uh, and then peak ferritin associated with both CRS and ICANs. We looked at other subgroups, so importantly, age, particularly less than 65 versus those 65 or older, did not have significant differences uh, in uh, acute toxicity, particularly in terms of CRS, though again, slightly higher utilization um, of corticosteroids, also similar rates of grade one through five uh, ICANs, though again, maybe slightly higher rate of grade three ICANs. Um, again, similar management and importantly, very similar outcomes um, when we break down uh, the PFS and OS according to age group in this cohort. As I highlighted earlier, there were 21 patients that had had a history of CNS involvement or including among that 21, uh, eight patients with active CNS disease at the time of cell infusion. Importantly, the rates of CRS and ICANS were not significantly different across this small subset of patients, again, in this larger cohort and similar utilization of corticosteroids um, and tocilizumab. No evidence of cerebral edema or seizures were observed in this uh, uh, small cohort of patients. When we look at their outcomes in terms of the free survival, uh, not significantly different, though you can see maybe a slight trend here that those patients with uh, CNS disease may be slightly inferior outcomes, but again, not significantly different. In terms of characteristics that may help us uh, predict for better outcomes, uh, two factors that appear to jump out, again, across a number of analyses, but particularly impactful in our study were performance status and LDH. And I do think these are likely surrogates of bad disease. Uh, now, whether or not this is an absolute contraindication proceeding with AxiCell, uh, I would argue no, but at least some consideration. Uh, if you have a disease that's not going to withstand that time from leukophoresis to cell infusion in those uh, first 7 to 14 days of T-cell expansion, uh, then maybe you might consider um, an alternative therapy, at least until you get adequate disease control. We've updated these analyses at ASH this year, now looking at the three-year outcomes of our cohort of commercially treated AxiCell. And again, the overall survival continues to be quite favorable uh, with a three-year overall survival estimate of 68.5%, again, comparing quite favorably to what was achieved uh, in the Zuma-1 study. And similarly, the three-year PFS estimates, again, com compare quite favorably with over 40% of patients without a progression event. 
We do see some late events. Uh, you can see somewhat stabilization and plateauing of that curve, uh, but among the 275 patients infused, there were 19 that had a progression event between the months of 11 and 28. Also an important feature to explore are the late cytopenias. So these are cytopenias extending beyond the first 30 days. And in my experience, you just sort of have this bimodal way where you have cytopenias in the first two weeks resulting from the lymphocyte depleting chemotherapy. Oftentimes you'll have recovery, but then you'll have a sort of a decline in those cytopenias over time as well. And we did observe about 10% of patients in this cohort did have cytopenias that extended beyond uh, the first 30 days. And you can see the breakdown at 20 four months and 36 months. Fortunately, as you get further out, there are uh, lower instances of grade three or higher cytopenias. Um, and again, the most common cytopenia beyond neutropenia is thrombocytopenia. Fortunately, uh, there was not a strong association between the incidence of um, neutropenia and infection. There was also not a strong association between uh, infection and IVIG or IgG replacement. If anything, those patients who were uh, receiving uh, prophylactic IVIG were more likely to have an infection, though there's likely a huge amount of selection bias uh, in that cohort of patients. Um, and again, this is a relatively early cohort. These patients were enrolled between after 2018, um, and so there were no COVID deaths at the time of uh, its analysis. What is also important to acknowledge is about 7% of these patients did have second cancers, and you can see the breakdown of the type of those second cancers, uh, including treatment-related uh, myeloid neoplasms outlined in this slide, including 10 patients with MDS, one with AML, and one with CMML. The median time to treatment-related uh, neoplasms was about 31 months. I, I do think that this is important because we're probably altering the natural history of this disease. And many of these patients in the real world, over 75% had three or more or more than three prior lines of therapy. Uh, so I do think that these second cancers are likely more reflective of their uh, extensive pretreatment as opposed to just the CAR itself. There are other cohorts that I'll briefly cover. Uh, so this is a 1,300 patient CIBMTR analysis of standard of care axi cell across the U.S. So you can see breakdown of the comorbidities among these patients, including 27% that have pulmonary comorbidities, 16% that had had a prior cancer, 13% with either cardiac or cerebrovascular risk factors, and then few patients with renal or hepatic um, comorbidities, and over half of patients had an ECOG performance status of two or higher. Uh, you can see the other breakdown again, they had 19 patients with secondary CNS involvement uh, in this cohort of patients. Fortunately, again, you see very comparable outcomes to what was achieved with the prospective Zuma-1 study in that 73.6% of patients achieved an objective response, over half achieved a complete response, um, and those responses appear to be quite durable. When they looked at their multivariate analysis, again, maybe a better chance of identifying char characteristics given the larger sample size here. What's quite striking to me is similar to what we had seen, ECOG performance status was a strong uh, factor associated with response, duration response, but also overall survival and progression-free survival. Uh, comorbidities such as hepatic disease uh, had an association with duration response, overall survival, and PFS. When you start to get into some of these other comorbidities, um, renal disease, cardiac disease uh, was associated with survival, suggesting maybe competing risks of death, uh, but not associated with some of the efficacy, at least early on. Again, looking at TISA cell now in a CIBMTR um, analysis with broken down according to those that were would have been Juliet eligible versus ineligible cohort size of 600 patients. Uh, also observed in this real world experience was very comparable objective response rates, duration of that best CR, and then a few patients that did have conversion similar to what we see in the Juliet study. And again, comparable PFS uh, according to this cohort of whether they were Julia eligible or ineligible and similar to what we've seen across a number of analyses, those patients with uh, best response of CR tend to do more favorably. 
when we observe the toxicity observed with TSSL in the real world setting, again, you can see similar rates of grade three or higher uh, CRS um, ICANs and again, slightly higher utilization um, of mitigating strategies. ICANs appears to be very similar. Again, whether patients are eligible or ineligible, uh, for the prospective study. You can see the breakdown here in terms of time to onset and resolution. What do you do when you have more than one option available? So this was another consortium that we had participated in uh, with about eight other large centers in the U.S. that had experience with both, both AxiCell and TSSL. And so when you're experienced with both constructs and you have the availability of both, um, now currently three constructs in the U.S., how do you choose? And so this is a breakdown of what actually happens in practice. You can see uh, that AxiCell was prescribed to 168 patients versus 92 who were prescribed uh, TSSL. And when we look at the characteristics associated with um, choice of construct, you can see some important features um, may distinguish some of these patients, particularly age uh, was a significant factor in terms of older patients more likely to receive TSSL, um, particularly those patients over 65 years of age. Interestingly, there was a higher percentage of patients uh, with primary refractory disease that were prescribed. Uh, AxiCell LDH performance status uh, was quite similar across the two groups. Uh, patients with TSA cell were actually a little more heavily pretreated, with 86% having three or more prior lines of therapy. And you can see the breakdown in terms of comorbidity index score. Um, and then median vein to vein time was longer, 45 days versus 28 days. And a quarter of patients receiving uh, commercial TSA cell received an out of spec product. So the important message in my mind is that we use different um, features to choose among the constructs available. And so there are differences in the baseline characteristics among these patients treated. Despite that, you see very similar and non-significantly uh, uh, different uh, in terms of the Treatment-related mortality in the first 30 days is nearly identical. The duration of response is nearly identical. See maybe a slight trend and difference there in the PFS with AxiCell in the blue curve versus TSSL in the red curve, but again, not a statistically significant difference, and there's no difference in overall survival. So I do think that um, centers with experience with both, though they may have uh, features that will help them or inform treatment decisions, uh, in general, the outcomes look to be quite comparable. So I'll summarize in that CAR T-cell therapy has clearly transformed the management of chemorefractory large B-cell lymphoma. Commercial AxiCell and T-cell can result in very similar uh, efficacy and safety results when we consider um, how those agents performed in the tightly controlled prospective studies. The patient populations that are receiving commercial CARs look quite different, both in terms of uh, baseline characteristics, prior treatment, and how they're managed, both pre-cell infusion and post-cell infusion. But again, despite that, we see very comparable outcomes. Um, and how we identify optimal candidates currently, I think, is debatable. We don't have an agreed upon uh, characteristics or features that um, will clearly predict for better or worse outcomes. But I do think that probably one of the best features is the tempo of the disease and surrogate measures of that are probably LDH and performance status. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to end. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you today. That's great. Oh. Thank you, Loretta. Very clear and beautifully presented, as always. I think we'll uh, uh, hold the questions to the end. We have a 20-minute uh, panel discussion. So next, uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Uh, Claire uh, Roddy, uh, who will be uh, presenting the UK experience. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to share our experience in the UK with you today. So I'm Claire Roddy. I'm based at UCL um, in London. Um, and these are my disclosures. So essentially, um, we'll look at some facets of the experience in the UK to date with um, the commercially available CAR T-cell products targeting CD19. And first of all, we need to understand a little bit about how the UK National uh, Clinical Panel um, for CAR T works. Okay, so here's a little map 
of the UK, indicating where our car T-cell centres are. So these are all licensed JC accredited car C T-cell delivery uh, centres within England on the map. And after the approval through EMA, all of these centres uh, kicked off and started delivering therapy. And it was done through it's effectively a national service um, to deliver CAR-T. Um, and the approvals process is, is done centrally um, via a panel, the NCCP panel. And this is the structure of the panel. So essentially you've got the chair, who I think might be in the room today, that's Andrew McMillan. Um, and he's ably supported by three independent experts in lymphoma, some patient representatives, some representatives from NHS England who are funding the, the, the products for our patients, and then of course representation from all of the CAR-T cell centres. And in terms of the aims of this panel, this national panel, really there were a few sort of important prerogatives. Um, really they wanted to define the eligibility criteria to make sure that we were uniformly practicing the same medicine across the UK. They wanted a very transparent process, objectivity, um, wanted to make sure that all of the cases were being critically reviewed, that data was being um, collected off the cases, that there was regional equity, that um, people across the UK were able to access the approval appropriate therapies and also there were some practical aspects like monitoring the national capacity to deliver um, these, these, these products to patients. Um, and in terms of the eligibility criteria within the UK, very um, much mirrors what we've seen in the clinical trials to date, both Juliet and Zuma 1, um, with some caveats that repeat biopsy seems to be a crit critically important to the UK delivery to confirm um, eligibility and to confirm the diagnosis. So, what are our outcomes like to date? Um, well, here's the number of patients that have been through the panel. So you can see 432 patients were submitted for consideration. Um, 404 were approved. Um, apheresis was completed in 375, and 300 have been infused to date. Now, in terms of the toxicity of these infused patients, this is a sort of a summary slide from Andrea Kunal's lovely paper summarising our experience to date. Um, and you can see that really the high-grade CAR T cell toxicity rates that we observed in the UK seem to be lower, both um, compared to the pivotal trials and also other real-world data sets. Um, and you can see the, uh, the proportions of patients affected by grade three or more um, high-grade events uh, in the slide. Um, and in terms of non-relapse mortality, we continue to observe these events beyond month one uh, with a 12-month uh, rate of 7%. And unlike perhaps what Lorette has seen, we, we did observe complications from long-term cytopenias, including an increased burden of infections and particularly COVID-19. In terms of um, the intention to treat, that's a sort of like a big consideration for the UK cohort because, of course, not all of the patients that we aphorese or not all the patients that we refer to the panel actually get through to receive a product. So 303 out of the 404 approved patients were infused. That means 26% failed to reach infusion. Um, and the median overall survival for the intention to treat population, of course, was lower um, than for the infused patients. And I draw your attention particularly to those patients um, on the graph here who weren't infused. And you can see just what a dismal outlook those patients have. Um, so in a sense, making CAR T cells more accessible or perhaps more readily available to patients might help that particular cohort of patients. And in terms of the efficacy that we've seen, um, we had some uh, early concerns that perhaps we were seeing less in the way of efficacy than had been reported in the trials and had been reported in other real world data sets. But I think that's equaled out um, over the sort of follow up time period here. And you can see that um, our 12-month PFS is 41.8% for AxiCell and 27.4% uh, for Tisicel. And what that translates into is that patients in complete response at six months had a 90% chance of ongoing remission at 18 months, which is great for those patients. But of course, 52% of our responding patients are progressing by month six. Um, so in terms of trying to understand from this big cohort, well, what are the factors associated either with primary failure to CAR-T or progression events? Um, some multivariate analysis were performed by the team led by Andrea. And two factors that came out to be particularly important were high LDH and the number of extranodal sites. So having more than three extranodal sites seemed to be strongly uh, predictive um, of impaired PFS. And there was a sort of a specificity with regards to which extranodal sites confer conferred worse prognosis, liver and bone being associated with, with much inferior PFS and OS. 
and ECOG performance data seem to have more of a correlation with overall survival rather than PFS in our hands. Um, and whenever they try to create, if you like, a sort of a prediction algorithm for who might do particularly badly, it appeared that those um, patients with DLBCL and transformed follicular who had two or more of these high-risk features um, had a particularly high risk of primary failure. That's a five-fold increased risk. So again, that allows us as clinicians to potentially counsel patients about these risks prior to going in to therapy. So there's lots of learnings that came out of this initial experience. Certainly we observed an improvement in our outcomes during the analysis period without particularly a change in the patient demographics or risk status. And what that tells us is that we're actually learning as we're performing um, these therapies for patients. We're learning as we're going along. Um, there was definitely an evidence for product selection bias, a bit like um, Loretta said in the last talk. Certainly Tisicel was more commonly used in older patients and there was a predilection for AxiCell for those patients with more bulky disease. Um, and in terms of there's French real world experience, which um, I'm sure Professor Chabanon will talk about, there seems to be a higher rate of early progressions after Tissus cell compared with Axi cell. Um, we saw sort of a 40% early progressive, progressive, progressive disease rate with Tissus cell and a relatively short median PFS. But overall, the long term survival seemed to be similar. So I guess it's too early in our cohort to maybe make any distinction between the products. And of course, one of the big bugbears for us is the fact that it takes quite a long time to make a car T-cell product, a commercial car product. And this has improved over the course of the delivery of our national programmes, um, but that may well impact upon some of the intention to treat issues that we see here in the UK. So what about the elderly patients? Some particular um, focus on them because they actually constitute a large proportion of those people coming through our clinics. And so there really is there's limited data um, on CD19 CAR in those patients who are older than 70 years. They're underrepresented in clinical trials. And it is important that we gather as much real world evidence as we can to help us inform patient selection and product choice and clinical management in these patients. Um, so when we looked at um, the, the, the different cohorts according to age, you can see it illustrated in this cartoon. Um, so we did see um, a significant number of patients over the age of 70, and in fact 14 patients over the age of 75. And when you looked at the baseline demographics of that older cohort, they had a higher IPI, again possibly the age feeding into that. They were certainly less likely to be considered fit for autograft, and they were more likely to have impaired renal function. Now, it turns out that older patients were less likely to be infused, and significantly so. And you can see in the little blue circles here, this is our sort of dropout rate, if you like. And in the younger patients, it's 23%, but in those over the age of 75, it's 50%. So that's clearly um, something we need to think about. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a predilection for Tissus cell for older patients, and that's reflected in this schema here. Um, you can see that particularly the older than 75 patients were predominantly treated with Tissus cell. And in terms of the toxicity profile, well, older patients were more likely to get ICANs, and that is something that's been reflected in other data sets, and that's with AxiCell, but not so much with TissaCell. So, um, again, something we could possibly expect um, according to other data sets. Now, importantly, what are the outcomes like? Well, it seems that those patients who actually get to infusion, even if they are elderly, they do have a similar PFS and OS compared to younger patients, as illustrated in these Kaplan-Meier curves. And if you separate it out according to AxiCell versus Tissus cell, it does appear that the PFS and OS hold true for both products um, according to those age groups. Now, in terms of non-relapse mortality, again, that's a big consideration for these patients uh, um, who are older age. And it doesn't appear that there's a significant difference, really, in the NRM according to age group. Um, and then this is just a little cartoon here to illustrate the experience in patients over the age um, of 75 years. Um, and you can see that it's not a bad outcome, 35% of patients with ongoing response at six months. Um, so these are patients who perhaps in some centres previously would not have been considered for CAR-T. So, it, you know, there is a feasibility to it and potentially good outcomes to be had. So I guess what are our learnings from this experience of looking specifically at these older patients? Well, elderly patients are more likely to drop out of the CAR-T pathway and not be infused. Um, and if you actually get them to infusion, the outcomes seem to be similar to younger patients. So in carefully selected patients, even over the age of 75, you can get encouraging long-term remission rates. 
And although we do see higher rates of ICANs in the AXI cell treated patients, the other toxicity profile seems to be broadly similar with younger patients. So in terms of your older patient cohort, assess their fitness early. And if they are a CAR-T candidate, they should come and see us promptly to determine whether or not it's the right course of action, because it may not necessarily be the right course of action for everyone. Now, the last piece I'm going to talk about very briefly is how helpful is early treatment response. Now, in the trials, we talk about the three-month PET scan and all of our sort of di clinical decision-making hangs off of that one analysis. But we're in the habit in the UK and certainly in the early experience with commercial products of performing a month one PET CT. Um, and we actually looked at this in a sort of a, a retrospective study to, to try and assess the utility of the early PET in determining whether patients were likely to have long-term responses or not. So this is what it looked like. Essentially, we tried to, um, to, to ask the question whether early identification of patients with transient or durable CAR-T responses could provide the rationale for maybe improving their outcome. So if we could determine that there was something associated with poor outcome, could we design rational combinations of therapy to prevent or counteract CAR-T failure? And so we decided on using the early doval response in patients with large B-cell lymphoma, using it as a potential tool to guide our treatment decisions. So we looked at 171 consecutive patients with relapse and refractory large B-cell lymphoma, treated with licensed CAR-T products. We did this across three centres. Um, and we re assessed the response according to the five-point Duval um, scoring system. And we performed these PET um, CT scans at one, three, and six months after therapy. Now, there was a specific consideration around Duval score four in those patients who had a radiotherapy bridging, because, of course, as we all know, there's post-inflammatory changes after bridging radiotherapy. And so, therefore, a Duval score of four in those patients may not necessarily have the same clinical meaning as a, a Duval score of four in someone who had not received radiotherapy. So we subclassified those as a Duval score 4R. Um, and transient response to CAR-T was defined as progressive disease by month six after having had a complete response or a partial response at the one month assessment. So this is uh, our analysis of uh, Kaplan-Meier looking at one month PET and how it can potentially predict for CAR-T failure in large B-cell lymphoma mapped according to your Duval score at month one. And so you can see that actually the Duval score one and two and the four RTs, so the ones with the post-inflammatory change after radiotherapy, are doing pretty well, as are the Duval score twos in terms of progression-free survival. The Duval score fours are doing less well, and the Duval score fives are doing appallingly badly. You can see there's sort of universal relapse um, before month three. And this is just a cartoon to illustrate that. So according to whether or not you achieve a CR and what your range of Duval scores are, you can see how you can assess the risk of progressive disease in those cohorts. Now, why is this helpful? Well, it might actually allow us to determine um, other ways of treating these patients who are at high risk, very high risk for relapse. Because if you look at the 12-month PFS, you can see that the Duval score fives score 0%. So none of those patients are going to remain in remission. Um, and I think it's, it's important to know this because we talk about this as a partial response to therapy, but in fact, for a patient, um, it's actually meaningless because um, it really represents failure of treatment. So I think um, this is very clear how we can categorise these patients into four prognostic groups and we can potentially make some treatment decisions off of the back of this and maybe we can define risk stratification tools, maybe we can define consolidative approaches such as radiation for instance or maybe immune modulatory therapies post CAR-T following on from this month one scan to allow us to improve outcomes for these, um, these patients who do particularly badly. So those are four sort of broad aspects that we've been looking at um, within the UK. I just, there's so many people to acknowledge, but Andrea has been instrumental in leading the data collection for, uh, for all of these projects, and Maeve O'Reilly for our mantle cell lymphoma projects, um, and Andrew McMillan, of course, for leading our large B-cell lymphoma NCCP, and all of the UK CAR centres, clinicians, patient representatives, NHS England for paying, and all of our patients and their families. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the panel discussion at the end. Fantastic presentation, Claire. Thank you. So next, we'll hear uh, from Professor Chabanon on the experience in, in France. 
Well, thank you for the invitation and in introduction. Um, when I was uh, first invited for, to speak at this event, I was chairing the Cellular Therapy and Immunobiology Working Party at EBMT. And I will speak as such, uh, uh, although I stepped down from this uh, position uh, as the meeting was postponed. So these are my uh, disclosures. And if you allow me, I will bring to you a sort of broader perspective of where Europe stands in terms of accessing commercial CAR T cells, approved CAR T cells for various uh, indications. I won't go into the details of regulatory aspects, but Europe has a specific regulation for this class of medicinal products, which is called Advanced Therapy Medicinal Products, or ATMPs, that was defined in a regulation published in 2007 by the European Commission. It defines four different subcategories of uh, ATMPs, and CAR T cells are considered as gene therapy medicinal products. Um, they are also considered as genetically modified organisms, and again, without going into details, that has some uh, organizational implications for uh, European hospitals. Now we spoke a, a lot during the last two presentations about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but this is not the only uh, category of diseases that uh, can be treated with CAR T-cells. Um, patients with relapse and refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia can have access to autologous anti-CD19 CAR T-cells. We do have access to a fully approved product, which is Tizacel also with a limit of age, children and young adults under the age of 25 years can be treated with Tizacel and under certain conditions. We also have access to uh, another product, which is Brexucel. Uh, and in some countries, um, adult patients with relapsed ALL can be treated with uh, Brexucel. In lymphoma, we've heard a lot about Tizacel and Axicel for the treatment of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but we also have access to uh, treatment for patients with mantle cell lymphoma, Brexus cell again. We do have access more recently uh, to uh, Lisa cell, which is a third uh, autologous uh, anti-CD19 um, CAR T cells. And very recently, we have had access under certain conditions to uh, anti-CD19 uh, CAR T cells for patients with relapsed uh, follicular lymphoma. Again, I won't go into the details of the different structures of the CAR nor the different uh, registration trials, but if you look at the uh, date the marketing approval was granted, it's been always granted several weeks or several months later in Europe as compared to the USA possibly with the exception of the recent approval for TISA cell in follicular lymphoma that was pretty much approved at the same time in the USA and in uh, Europe. And this explains uh, uh, in part why real-world data are available with shorter follow-up and with a smaller number of patients uh, in Europe than they are uh, in the USA. Now, we've not discussed that uh, in depth, but obviously uh, one of the most um, um, important observations was the recent publications of three randomized clinical trials comparing autologous anti-CD19 CAR T cells to standard of care, meaning salvage chemotherapy and uh, IDOS consolidation therapy supported with uh, autologous transplantation uh, in chemosensitive patients. Two of these studies, the ZUMA7 trial uh, looking at AxiCell and the TRANSFORM study looking at uh, LISOCELL are uh, positive in terms of progression-free uh, survival and even free survival. The third trial, the Belinda trial that compares TISA cell to standard of care is negative. Uh, the FDA approved the use of AxiCell and LISOCELL, a second-line uh, therapy in relapsed refractory DLBCL in April and June 2022. The, the information is quite recent for LISOCELL. We are waiting for similar approval by EMA in the forthcoming weeks, but again, the approval will come in Europe uh, somewhat later uh, after, um, after the USA. 
And uh, we've not talked a lot about multiple myeloma, but CAR T cells are now an option for patients with advanced multiple myeloma that have received at least one agent across the three major uh, classes of drugs that are being used in this uh, lymphoid malignancy, pro proteasome inhibitors, imids, and anti-CD38 uh, antibodies. So these agents are available uh, in Europe since uh, the middle of uh, 2021 for the first one, and most recently uh, for the uh, second one. So in other words, uh, if we try, and I realize that some of my table has disappeared, but we have uh, two classes of uh, CAR T cells, one targeting CD19, the other one targeting uh, BCMA, and they are uh, approved for a variety of uh, B cell uh, malignancies in, uh, in Europe, offering a choice and several options to treating physicians. Nevertheless, the path to adoption is more complex than getting marketing approval. Uh, uh, after getting central marketing approval from the European Medicines Agency, the negotiations for prices and reimbursement happen at the national uh, level, and the coordination between uh, European countries exists, but there is no full harmonization of the process. I took this illustration from a recent analysis looking at the delay between marketing approval and final negotiation for reimbursement at several European countries. It does not, uh, uh, it is not restricted to the field of CAR T cells, but all innovative therapies, but as you can see, uh, the number of days is quite long. So patients know that the product is approved, but in many countries you don't have access to this product because it is not yet uh, fully uh, reimbursed. In the interim period, you may find some dispositions in some countries that allow early access to patients and off-label use. I took the example of the temporary recommendations for use as originally described uh, uh, approximately 10 years ago by the French competent authority, the French Food and Drug Administration. And this was really helpful in my country to get early access to CAR T cells and explains why French patients enjoyed relatively easy access to CAR T cells as compared to many uh, other uh, European countries. The complexity of the supply chain adds to the hurdles to access CAR T cells. Uh, Dr. Roddy nicely showed the UK organization, and I think it is replicated in many European countries. At the moment, we have uh, uh, approximately 25 centers that offer access to CAR T cells uh, in Europe. But on top of that, there are some constraints that are uh, linked to the uh, manufacturing process. I mentioned the two CAR T cells targeting BCMA that are available for patients with multiple myeloma, but actually the manufacturing capacities for European patients for those two products are at the moment quite limited. And the number of patients that can benefit from receiving these uh, products are quite small as compared to the potential candidates for uh, these treatments. It has been mentioned that not all hospitals offer access to CAR T cells. Treating hospitals must be qualified and usually by regional or national healthcare or competent authorities by manufacturers and marketing authorization holders for each CAR T cells, and this leads to multiple documentary audits and on-site visits that add to the workload to hospitals that are already strained by consequences of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and by other uh, external uh, situations. For qualifications, two aspects are considered. The supply chain, let me remind you that aphoresis facilities are usually small size facilities that can uh, quite soon uh, uh, be uh, strained by the workload and on the clinical side, risk mitigation plans. And I think the learning curve that has been mentioned uh, on several occasions was a key contributor to real world data being similar or even better in terms of management of side effects and the registration studies. <laughs> 
So CAR T cells are available to patients only at a small fraction of hospitals, mostly public hospitals, at least in France, more, mostly tertiary care centers, mostly university hospitals or comprehensive cancer centers. That means that patients treated at general hospitals must be referred to uh, tertiary care centers. And we know through comparison of various areas in countries such as France, that the fraction of candidate patients that are referred to uh, treating centers may significantly vary from one area to another, depending on the relation established between uh, different uh, hospitals. CAR T cells obviously are among the most expensive medicinal products that are available in Europe. And uh, healthcare authorities, um, in particular healthcare technology assessment agencies, have made an obligation to collect real world data and organize long term follow up to better assess the actual medical value of these products. So, this has led to several uh, initiatives. As an EBMT uh, um, a member, I was involved in the design with several other individuals, including uh, Chiara Bonini, who is here today, Jorgen Kubal, and many others, in designing a cellular therapy form that helped collect data on patients treated with CAR T cells, very similar approach to the CIBMTR uh, registry that has already been mentioned. And you can see over time that despite all the difficulties that I mentioned before, that the number of patients treated with CAR T cells is increasing. There are now more than 3,000 patients registered in the EBMT uh, registry. Most of these patients in dark blue are uh, treated with commercial CAR T cells, approved CAR T cells. There is also a significant fraction of patients treated with investigational CAR T cells, whether in the context of industry-sponsored clinical trials or in some instances in the context of academia-sponsored clinical trials, and we've seen some beautiful presentations that lead to uh, starting, initiating early phase one, phase two trials with newly uh, designed CAR T cells or other immune effector cells based therapies. In terms of MAP, obviously the uh, registry also collects data on the uh, UK activity that was described by Dr. Roddy, but you can see that most countries, including in Western Europe and in now Eastern Europe, are reporting uh, data to the EBMT uh, registry. The EBMT registry uh, negotiated with the European Medicines Agency in the context of the uh, registry initiative, and uh, the EMA published a qualification opinion on cellular therapy module of the EBMT a few years ago. Despite this achievement, we faced some hurdles due to both internal and external considerations. Uh, and we know that we only collect a fraction of the, pati the patients that are treated by CAR T cell, trying to improve on that. In the limitations of information provided by registration trials have, has been uh, highlighted on several occasions. And for the sake of time, I will uh, skip this slide. And the advantage of collecting registry data are listed on this slide, but more representative of the actual patient population. Long-term follow-up is feasible, and the uh, uh, necessity to collect intent-to-treat analysis may be feasible in the context of uh, registry. Limitations are linked to available uh, resource. Intent to treat analysis not only from aphoresis but even before, and some registries are trying to collect data as soon as the possibility to treat patients with CAR T cells is uh, thought of. For bad and for good, there are competing initiatives at the national level, uh, and uh, some of these national um, registries have started to report data. This is the uh, Spanish. Uh, registry, one of the first uh, real-world data that were reported in Europe, looking at TISA cell, and pretty much you can find the same conclusions that were previously described by uh, Dr. Uh, Nastupil and Dr. Roddy, which is that the uh, data from real-world um, uh, situations match the data from registration trials, while the patient population in part may not have been eligible for treatment in registration trial. Dr. Rodi mentioned the uh, DCAR-T registry, the French registry now with more than 1,000 patients 
collected. This was presented last year at ASH, updated at the last EA meeting. Uh, several hundred patients treated with either Axicel or Tizacel. Overall survival is the same uh, in both cohorts, somewhat higher overall response rate uh, with Axicel, somewhat higher uh, neurotoxicity, and uh, overall, again, same uh, survival. And more recently, a single site study from Paris Saint Louis, which was one of the first active European centers. Again, don't have time to go into detail, but interestingly, looking at the quality of T cells at time of collection and the relation to uh, clinical response in a small cohort of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma may be uh, an interesting predictor of who should get or not uh, treatment with uh, uh, CAR T cells. Very briefly, the case for point of care manufacturing. This is allowed under certain conditions by European uh, regulation, what we call the hospital exemption. This may have several advantages, in particular, lower the manufacturing costs and, and treat some patients with often indications for which no commercial product exists. I will briefly mention the Spanish experience again and the development of the ARI001 product that is an autologous CAR T cells quite similar to TISA cell. And this, uh, a consortium of Spanish hospitals was, was able to treat uh, several uh, dozens of patients with relapsed refractory um, lymphoid malignancies uh, showing similar um, toxicity and efficacy profiles to commercial products. I will conclude by mentioning the uh, go car -T Coalition, which is an initiative jointly uh, supported by EBMT and the European Hematology Association uh, that has established uh, several working groups. And the goal is to bring together the different stakeholders in Europe in order to foster the development of the fields and speed up access of European patients to CAR T cells, several um, working groups and, and initiatives as part of this uh, coalition. And in particular, uh, we've started to support, financially support, several uh, ongoing studies looking at different aspects. One interesting um, point that I'd like to stress is that we are trying to bring together several professional associations to work together in order, again, to speed up the process in Europe. So in conclusions, we have access to a handful of autologous medicinal products in Europe, usually with approval happening several weeks or months after the US. The medical value of these medicinal products remains to be fully assessed. It's quite reassuring that most available data support similarities with registration trials, and many more products are in developmental phase. Early clinical trials are restricted to even smaller number of selected centers. Thank you for your attention.